Good morning, Job, day 10, chapters 38 to 42. This has been obviously a heavy book to go through, as it always is, because it is a book about suffering. And in the New Testament, there's this comment in James, which I'll refer to later, that indicates to us that this book has been given to us for our comfort. So this is not just some old irrelevant book we're reading. This has been given to us by the Holy Spirit in the canon of Scripture in order for us to learn and to be comforted and encouraged when we suffer in life, which each of us will do. So today the book comes to a climax as God now steps on to, well, almost like the judge at the bar now begins to pass judgment as he's been hearing the arguments going on. And the effect is dramatic on both Job and his friends. So let's just remind ourselves before we have a look at this quite complex uh, portion of scripture, what the major problems with these groups were. First of all, Job's friends. The problem with Job's friends is that they accused Job of being evil. They said he was a hypocrite, that he didn't even know God, and that this was why he suffered. And if he were just to reconcile with God and seek God, and be at peace with God, get saved, in other words, as we would say in the New Testament, then he would be delivered from his suffering. Job, and of course they were wrong in that, Job very much did know God, and he was in relationship with God, and in fact, uh, it was his actual righteousness that drew attention to him in the beginning, if you go and read the first, um, well, the opening chapter. Job's problem, on the other hand, was that, um, and this was increasingly so through, through the middle of the book as he begins to vent his suffering, that he slipped into accusing God of being unfair, accusing God of being unjust in the suffering that he endured. Then in chapters 38 and 39, God begins his argument and he then proceeds to ask Job a list of questions which demonstrate the great superiority of God over man. So he, he begins, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then he continues with this great list of questions and, of, and the display of his majesty. And in that argument, chapters 38 and 39, God basically says this, Job I am infinitely greater than you in knowledge. If you, you know such a small amount, Job. I know everything. I am infinite in knowledge. Then, Job, I am infinitely greater than you in my essential being. I am an eternal being. Were you there in the beginning when I created all things? I don't depend on anyone for my existence. I am self-existent. I am an eternal being. I'm infinitely greater than you in that respect. Then he says, Job, I am infinitely more involved in the creation than you are. And this, of course, was one of Job's comments or, or complaints that God was separated from the creation, that there was darkness between man and God and man can't reach God and God is somehow separate from the creation. And God corrects us. He says, I am far more involved in creation than you are. I am far more of the earth than you are. I created the earth. I sustain the earth. I feed the animals. Not uh, a sparrow falls in the, word of Je in the words of Jesus that I don't give permission for, that I don't know about. Not one hair turns white or black without my permission, without my sovereign hand being involved. I am far more involved in the world than even you are, Job. And uh, that's actually a comforting thought. And then he says, uh, Job, I am infinitely more powerful than you are. He says, can you command the snow and the hail and the rain and the lightning? And, and he displays his great power in creation. And in fact, God still uses creation to do that for all mankind, to display to the earth that he exists that he's infinitely powerful, that he's glorious, that he has all wisdom and knowledge. This is what the created order does reveal to us. So these are the, the, uh, the comments that God now makes to Job. 
how infinitely greater than Job he is. And he says, in the light of all this, I am not detached. I am not mistaken. I am not out of control. And it is an unrighteous thing, Job, that you have charged me with these things. Think of who I am before you charge me with being unfair. Wow. And uh, hence the rebuke in chapter 40, verse 8, which is kind of the culmination of this first part of God's charge against Job. He says this, Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? And that then gets to the heart of the issue. Whenever human beings accuse God of being unfair or point their finger at God, they are trying to justify themselves. They are saying, God, I am more righteous than you. I understand justice better than you do. I am more fair in my judgments than you are. But God says to Job, will you annul my judgment so that you can be justified? Wow. Well, all of this has a dramatic impact on Job, and he, um, he repents. And we see his first bit of repentance in chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Uh, then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. He sees himself as he truly is. I'm vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. And again in chapter 42, after God has spoken again, there is a further indication of Job's repentance where he says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours is withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me, which I, I didn't know. Listen, please, and, and, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. And so Job finds courage to speak one more time. And he says, I've, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, God says to, to Job, would you annul my judgment? To justify yourself. One of the tritest comments that, that you can hear when preachers are trying to help people deal with suffering is for them to say, well, we live in a fallen world and therefore there is suffering. And uh, but but, you know, one day we will be OK in heaven. And and uh, for now, God has people, given people freedom of choice and evil people choose to do evil things and that's not God's fault. That is a terrible argument. There is displayed through the book of Job the fact that God is sovereign over suffering. That God uses suffering for his own purposes. Yes, to do us good in the end, but he is sovereign over even the suffering. And that may seem like a, a cruel and unpleasant thought. But if you get your head around what that means, that God is never out of control, even in the midst of the worst suffering, God is not out of control. He is using it for good. It is somehow in the mysterious plan of God designed for his glory in the end. Therefore, you don't have to fear the future that some evil person is going to make some free will choice to rape someone that you love or yourself or kill you or hurt you or something. And it's out of God's control as if he can't control things. No, God is sovereign. And in the light of this, Job repents. And this is the next thing to notice that repentance is a good thing. You know, we don't hear Enough preaching of repentance in churches. Go and listen to famous preachers on the internet. Go and, you know, watch YouTube videos of famous preachers. Listen to what is preached in, I don't want to say your church because I don't want to imply that your preacher is doing this wrong. But the truth is that many preachers don't charge people with repentance. 
Whereas you go read the New Testament and Jesus is telling people to repent. The apostles are telling people to repent. Repentance is a good thing. And we see Job repent in dust and ashes. He says, I abhor myself. I repent. I am sorry, God. I admit that I am a sinner. I have broken your law. I am at fault, O God. Please forgive me. I am in need of forgiveness. And why is it a good thing? Because look what happens when he repents. God is so gracious and compassionate. God, God's heart is to forgive, but he demands humility. The sacrifices of God are a humble and contrite spirit, says the Bible. And so we must repent. We must abhor the sin in ourselves and seek God's forgiveness continually in our lives. What do you need to repent of? Because the pathway to the blessing of God and to peace with God surely is repentance. Well, so much to notice in this uh, section of scripture we read. The next thing we, we read then is in uh, chapter 41. Uh, God then picks up his, his speech. The judge now speaks again after Job's initial repentance. And Chapter 41, it's strange because now God starts to talk about particular beasts, Leviathan and the behemoth, which we don't know really what those animals were. But he's using those animals as an example to Job of how powerless Job is, actually. Look, by comparison, even to this animal, Job, think of how powerless you are. Uh, you can't even tame the beasts, says God. And I want you to consider this. Everything under heaven is mine. There is nothing that can compare to me or challenge me. There is no one to whom I owe anything. I don't owe anybody anything. And any good that I do to people is my gracious kindness in their lives. No one can point their finger at me, Job, and say I owe them anything. Everything under heaven is mine. I do with it as I will. My friend, th these are humbling thoughts. I understand that. But that's what the book of Job does for us. It is humbling. It is humbling to admit that God owes us nothing and that everything is his. And we cannot ever complain against him and tell him that he's unfair. Remember that when you accuse me of being unjust, Job. Then chapter 42, uh, Job uh, repents again. He says, I, I have, I've, I've now seen my error, God, and I'm sorry. And in verses uh, five and six that I read to you now, where Job says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. And that made all the difference for Job. And I, I want to read you what I, I wrote on, on those words this morning. This, of course, describes the moment every human being must have to be saved. For these words should most forcefully apply to our experience of Jesus Christ through the gospel. When the idle rumors of it, which never captured our attention in time past, suddenly in a moment become the terrible and glorious reality of our own souls. And you know that's true of you, that there was a time where you heard the gospel and you were taken to church and you kind of knew about Jesus. But it was like Job saying, I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear. It never captured your attention. But there comes that terrible and glorious moment where you suddenly realize this applies to me. I am a sinner. I am undone. I am condemned because I have loved the darkness and not the light. And yet Jesus has died for me. And that glorious moment is the moment where you encounter God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you are saved. That's kind of like Job saying, but now my eye sees you. I've heard of you, but now my eye sees you. And I pray that that would be your experience if it hasn't yet been. It truly is a great thing to encounter Christ personally. Then in chapter 42, verse 8, God says to Job's three friends, Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him. Lest I deal with you according to your folly, 
because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Um, and it, it did strike me this morning that in the very grace that God now offers these three men, he destroys the very arguments that they had laid against Job. Because he says, basically, you have been sinning by the things you've said against my servant Job. And yet you don't suffer like him. Hmm? I'm graceful. I'll forgive you without any suffering. So here we see also how important it is to God that we love and forgive one another. That there be unity amongst God's people. And we must always strive for peace with one another and to forgive one another. For if you do not forgive others their sins against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. The words of Jesus. Finally, chapter 42, verse 10. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And then if, if you go and read James chapter 5, verse 11, James says, In your suffering in this life, consider Job and see how, though God was sovereign over Job's suffering, how he is very gracious and compassionate and merciful and how he meant it for Job's good in the end. And this, of course, is the purpose of the book for us. The Christian life requires patience because there is suffering in this life. There is just no getting around it. Endurance is key. Patience is key. And knowing that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. That his heart is for you. And that he will see to it in the end that you enjoy fullness of life. Beyond your wildest dreams, in fact, as it was in Job's case. He thought he would never be restored. The knowledge and the hope of this can give us the courage and peace that we need to endure whatever hardships do come our way in this life. God is for you, my friend. And whatever you suffer, if you stay humble before him and you keep seeking him and you trust him in it, he will work it all for your good in the end. So God bless you, and I'll see you as we pick up the book of Psalms.